Superstation, the future radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Monday, May 31st, 2021. It is Memorial Day. Hope everybody's doing well today. Well, it's a lot going on, and we know the um, commemoration, the 100th commemoration of the Tulsa Race Massacre is taking place now. I've been watching all the documentaries uh, on it. I watched the two-hour one on the History Channel. Uh, I watched it three times, actually, <laughs> and recorded it. <laughs> uh, also, I watched the one uh, on CNN uh, as well. It came on CNN Monday. Uh, so we're going to talk about that on a Tuesday show. All right. Originally, I was going to talk about it today, but uh, I wanted to deal with the African-American, the hidden African-American origins of uh, Memorial Day. And uh, I was going to do it. I was going to try to do this broadcast early in the day uh, and then deal with um, the Tulsa race massacre um, on tonight's show today's show but uh it didn't work out like that so <laughs> it's been a busy day so we're going to talk about the uh hidden african-american origin of memorial day the hidden african-american origin of memorial day uh we'll deal with that today and then on our tuesday show we'll deal with um uh, my thoughts on the tulsa race massacre uh, documentary on the history channel all right. So a lot of people have been seeing uh, information about uh, the uh, hidden African-American origins of uh, Memorial Day going back to uh, 1865, May 1st, 1865. So we're going to deal with some of that history. We're going to talk about also Decoration Day, uh, May 30th, 1868. We'll deal with that as well. And we're going to deal with uh, some Civil War history uh, also. OK. All right, so everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. And I first found out of, about this uh, information is about 2001, 2011. There was an article from um, thegrio.com that dealt with uh, how African Americans actually celebrated the first uh, Memorial Day. And oftentimes you have things like this that take place and we don't get any credit for them. Uh, and this is an example of that. But, you know, over the past few years, more information has come out and um, it's talked about more. But still, uh, I don't think we get as much credit as we should. All right. So on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the comforts of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history, politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, love, sex, health issues, relationships, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And you can support the uh, African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And you can still uh, register for the online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understand the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school, what we do with thousands of years of history. It's a nine-week online course that I teach, uh, so visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll post the link here uh, also. Okay, so when we deal with the um, history of uh, Memorial Day, right, it takes us back to the uh, U.S. Civil War. Uh, now, Memorial Day is an American holiday observed on the last Monday uh, of May, the last Monday of May, honoring the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. Memorial Day 2021 uh, fell on uh, May 31st, uh, uh, May 31st, uh, uh, 
the uh, last Monday in May. Now, Memorial Day also marks the unofficial start of summer and is celebrated by cookouts, three-day weekends, et cetera. Uh, many people don't know that Memorial Day has its origins with African-Americans at the end of the U.S. Civil War. Now, in 1966, the federal government declared Waterloo, New York, Waterloo, New York, as the official birthplace of Memorial Day. This is before uh, African-Americans were getting any type of credit for having the first Memorial Day or the first Decoration Day. And this information really didn't surface until uh, about 2011, okay, dealing with the African-American uh, influence. Now, uh, so Waterloo, New York, which first celebrated um, Memorial Day, May 5th, 1866, OK, May 5th, 1866, was chosen because it hosted an annual community wide event during which businesses closed and residents decorated the graves of soldiers with flowers and flags. But even before that took place, even before then, uh, the first uh, Memorial Day celebration or the first decoration day uh, was hailed by African-Americans, okay? And this was uh, May 1st, 1865 in Charleston, South Carolina. May 1st, 1865 in Charleston, South Carolina. And this is based upon two reports that historian David uh, Blight found, um, one in the New York Tribune and the other in the Charleston Courier. Uh, and the reports are that a crowd of 10,000 people, mostly freed uh, slaves, former slaves, African-Americans, with some white missionaries staged a parade around a racetrack. Uh, it was a horse uh, horse track. 3,000 uh, African-American school children carried bouquets of flowers and sang the song John, John Brown's Body, John Brown's Body, okay, dealing with John Brown at Harpers Ferry, uh, the white man that had an uh, insurrection, uh, John Brown. Uh, who wanted to free the slaves. Now, members of the famed 54th Massachusetts uh, Regiment and other uh, Black Union regiments were in attendance and performed double time marches. African American ministers recited verses from the Bible also. I'm going to give you some background uh, information on that story as well. Now, th th there were a few articles uh, that I've seen over the past few years dealing with this history. I saw a lot of people circulating the one from uh, Time Magazine. The one from Time Magazine actually came out in 2020. Uh, I read it when it came out. Uh, it is May 22nd, 2020. And uh, it's the Overlooked Black History of Memorial Day. The Overlooked Black History of Memorial Day. Uh, actually, they have a photograph of the um, 50th Regiment. Uh, in, was it in here? The 50th Regiment? Okay, no, it's the one from um, uh, the one from history.com actually has a picture of the uh, 54th Regiment. I'll, I'll show you that one. Uh, there's also one from history.com, the official website of the History Channel. One of the earliest uh, Memorial Days was held by freed African Americans. One of the earliest Memorial Days was held by uh, freed African Americans. And we'll flip over to this one also here. Okay. One well, of the earliest Memorial Day ceremonies was held by freed African Americans. At the close of the Civil War, people recently freed from enslavement in Charleston, South Carolina, honored fallen Union soldiers. And they have a picture in here of um, the, uh, the Battle of Fort Wagner. The Battle of Fort Wagner um, on Morris Island was a was the Union attack that took place July 18th, 1863. It was led by the 54th Massachusetts Vol Volunteer Infantry. Uh, the infantry was one of the first major American military units made up of black soldiers. When you saw the movie Glory with Morgan Freeman and Matthew Broderick and um, 
uh, Denzel Washington. OK, that's about the 54th uh, regiment. OK, 50, uh, 54th regiment during the U.S. Civil War. So this is a famous uh, painting here. OK. Let's continue. All right. Now. And we're coming up here on a break in just a minute, so we will uh, uh, have to go to break in just a minute. OK, so decoration day is what uh, before it was called Memorial Day, it was called decoration day. And this goes back to uh, May 5th, 1868, May 5th, 1868, three years after uh, the Civil War ends. General John A. Logan who was a leader of an organization of Northern Civil War veterans, called for a nationwide day of remembrance later that month, later in the month of May 1868. Um, he said, he proclaimed, quote, the 30th of May 1868 is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land, end quote, he proclaimed, okay? The date of decoration day, as he called it, was chosen because it was not the anniversary of any particular battle. OK, so for a long time, the, the celebration that African-Americans had at the at the horse track, horse race track, May 1st, uh, 1865, for a long time, that was overlooked. OK, and we weren't given uh, any as a lot of things, you know, we weren't given any credit for um, for having the first decoration day or what. Uh, people would call the uh, first Memorial Day. OK, that just uh, went unnoticed. All right. We're coming up here on the break. We're going to continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Monday, May 31st, 2021, Memorial Day. Um, we're talking about the hidden African American uh, origins, the hidden African American origin of Memorial Day, uh, and this goes back to May first, eighteen sixty-five. You've heard me talk about this before. I know more people are talking about it uh, now. I saw some social media posts, and people are circulating the information uh, that actually comes from the Time Magazine article called "The Overlooked Black History of Memorial Day." That Time Magazine article came out May 22nd, 2020. OK, and I actually did a broadcast uh, two years ago. It's on YouTube where, where we dealt with the African-American origins of uh, Memorial Day uh, all, as well. All right. I, I want to go back to this article here uh, and the call in number is 313-778-7600. Uh, if you have a quick question or comment, 313-778-7600. I uh, want to remind you, you can still register for the online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. So we deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, it's a nine-week online course that I teach. Uh, when you scroll down uh, the homepage of our website, you'll see the information for a radio show. We're here six days a week. And you can uh, listen to podcasts as well. Uh, you click right here. We have the information for the show. We have the flyer. Click right here to register here. It takes you to the next page. Click on enroll. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. All the sessions are recorded. If you miss anything, you can go back and watch it. You'll still have access to the course even after it's over. It's a nine-week online course. We do do deal with about 18 hours of, of teaching in total, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's regularly one hundred thirty dollars is on sale now. Sixty dollars since we're about halfway through the course. As soon as you register, you can watch the class we just did this past Saturday. Also, you can watch the class where uh, archaeologist Nubia Wardford uh, did the presentation for our class dealing with the origin of ancient Kush and the African queens of antiquity. OK, so we dealt with some ancient African history as well. All right. We're going to post a link here or visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, 
ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. And the Ma'afa is a key Swahili word, which means the great disaster, which, which refers to our, our Holocaust, the transatlantic slave trade. All right, I want to go back to, uh, th th there's an article here from uh, history.com uh, called Memorial Day. And this, it just deals with Memorial Day history. And um, I'm also referencing my notes. I have six pages of notes on this on the history of Memorial Day because I've dealt with this previous year. So uh, I'm referencing my notes at the same time. Um, it, right before the break, we talked about how on uh, May 5th, uh, 1868, General John A. Logan, leader of an uh, organization for Northern uh, Civil War veterans, called for a nationwide day of remembrance later that month, later May 1868. Now, this is just three years after the Civil War ended. And I'm going to give you, we're going to deal with some uh, Civil War history also in just a minute to recap this, because you have to understand some Civil War history to understand what takes place during Reconstruction. Now, the 30th of May 1868, he said, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their uh, country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet, churchyard in the land, he proclaimed, okay? So the date of uh, Decoration Day, as he called it, was chosen because it was not the anniversary of any particular battle. It was not the anniversary of any particular battle. Now, on the first Decoration Day, or what white people uh, acknowledged, as the first decoration day. General James Garfield made a speech at Arlington National Cemetery and 5,000 participants uh, decorated the graves of the 20,000 Civil War soldiers buried there, all right? Now, originally Memorial Day just dealt with the uh, soldiers that died in the Civil War because this is before World War I, before World War II, et cetera. Now it acknowledges, uh, uh, all people, all soldiers who have died uh, in various wars, not just the uh, Civil War. OK. All right. Now, many northern states held similar commemorative uh, events and reprised the tradition in subsequent years. By 1890, each one had made Decoration Day an official state holiday. By 1890, each state had made Decoration Day an official state holiday. Southern states, on the other hand, continued to honor the dead on separate days until uh, after uh, World War One. OK, until after World War One. And I want to uh, go uh, back to this picture here. Uh, of the 54th uh, Regiment. Where's that one? Let me pull this up here just a second. Okay. 54th Massachusetts Regiment, uh, July 1863. Okay, let's continue here. All right, so for decades, Memorial Day continued to be observed on May 30th, okay? For decades, Memorial Day continued to be observed on uh, May 30th, uh, the date that uh, General Logan had selected for the first Decoration Day. But in 1968, the U.S. Congress passed what's known as the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, which established Memorial Day as the last Monday in May in order to create a three day weekend for federal employees okay so this is how it goes from memorial day goes from being celebrated on may 30th to the last day in may okay is is known the the u.s congress in 1968 passed what's known as the uniform monday holiday act okay which established memorial day as the last monday in may in order to create a three-day weekend for federal employees now this change went into effect in 1971 the same law also declared Memorial Day as a federal holiday. Now, if we look at uh, briefly some uh, uh, Civil War history, 
to uh, understand how all this is uh, connected. Uh, rather, when we when we look at uh, Abraham Lincoln becoming president elect in early November, it was November third, uh, uh, right about November third, uh, uh, eighteen sixty. Okay, Abraham Lincoln becoming president elect. Uh, he was the candidate for a newly formed uh, party called the Republican Party. All right, the Republican Party was founded in eighteen fifty four by groups of abolitionists, and this was. The Republican Party was founded as a uh, result of what's known as the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 dealt with leaving it up to uh, those people who are going to inhabit uh, land out west, leaving, leave, leaving it up to them to determine whether or not they were going to have slavery or not. OK, this is the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. And prior to that, you know, they tried to have a uh, a balance between slave holding states and free states coming into the union, slave holding states and free states. So the Republican Party is going to be formed to be the counter to the Democratic Party at the time. The Whig Party, which is founded in 1830, somewhere around 1834, the Whig Party is dying out, W-H-I-G, and the Republican Party is going to be formed. So uh, early November uh, 1860, Abraham Lincoln becomes president elect southern states fear that lincoln is going to free the slaves okay so uh, december 20th 1860 uh six weeks after uh lincoln becomes president elect december 20th 1860 uh south carolina is the first state to secede from the union december 20th 1860 that's going to be followed uh by uh, uh six other uh states um, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas. Okay. They're going to elect to secede from the union and they're going to form what's known as the Confederate States of America, the CSA, the Feder Federal States in the, of America. They formed this in February of 1861. Now, the Confederacy is going to elect uh, Jefferson Davis, who was a former Secretary of War and a hero of the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. And, you know, I just did a, a couple of weeks ago, I, we did a show dealing with the history of slavery and the Mexican-American War and showing the relationship between the Mexican-American War and slavery. And uh, that's uh, Mexican-American Wars, 1846 to 1848. And we know that the year before the Mexican-American Mexican War started, Texas was admitted into the Union as a slaveholding state. OK. Um, and so you have Texas being admitted into the union as a slaveholding state. Uh, you have Texas winning their independence from uh, Mexico in 1836. And also you have the Texas Rangers who are going to start in the, right about 1836. They're going to start as uh, uh, bounty hunters who are hired by slave owners in Texas to go into Mexico and capture runaway slaves because a lot of enslaved Africans were run away to Mexico because Mexico was free territory. We talked about the, the Southern underground railroad going into Mexico. All right. So all this history, we have, we have to understand the chronology of this history. Uh, in, you're going to have what's known as the compromise of 1850, which comprised of, comprised of five uh, congressional bills. One of those bills dealt with the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which allowed authorities up north to deputize white people to hunt down runaway slaves, run away from the south, even though the north was free territory. And they could capture them, take them back into, um, uh, return them to their masters, take them back into the southern territory. So because of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, and you see this depicted in the movie called, uh, in the movie Harriet, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, because of that, that's going to cause more runaway slaves to go into Canada. And this is going to galvanize abolitionist uh, forces again, uh, even more so, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Then you have Harriet Beecher Stowe, who uh, writes the book uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852 which is based upon the life of uh, a runaway slave from Maryland named Josiah Henson. And Josiah Henson 
uh, runs away with his family. They go into Canada. They, they run away on the Underground Railroad. They go into Canada. Uh, he becomes a Methodist minister and an educator and works on the Underground Railroad. Helps runaway slaves. He writes his autobiography. Um, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe reads it, and she patterns the fictitious character of, of Uncle Tom after the real life uh, man named Josiah Henson. All right, uh, there's an episode of um, uh, uh, the Jeffersons that deals with. Uh, the real Uncle Tom and uh, Josiah Henson. Uh, and you have uh, Louise Jefferson's cousin, I think it is, who's a butler. And um, he reads books in the, the, the white man he works for, has a library in his home and he reads books. Um, and he schools Tom, he schools uh, George and uh, Lionel on who the real uh, Uncle Tom is, okay, Josiah Henson. All right, so you 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 have this taking place. It's 1852. Uh, the the book um, Uncle Tom's Cabin comes out. It becomes an international bestseller. Sells 300,000 copies its first year. It exposes America to the real horrors of slavery, and it, in it, it becomes banned in the state of Maryland. It becomes banned in the state of Maryland where um, Josiah Henson is from. 1854, the uh, Kansas Nebraska Act of uh, uh, the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854 takes place. Later in 1854, also the uh, Republican Party is going to be founded. All right, and then their candidate, uh, November 1860, is going to win the presidency. Abraham Lincoln. Southern states think that Lincoln is going to free the slaves. So they start seceding from the Union. When you read their statements of secession, they tell you that uh, slavery is essential to their way of life and essential to their wealth. OK, so they're going to uh, secede from the Union to maintain slavery and maintain their way of life and maintain their wealth. All right. It wasn't it, they, they, they didn't do all this for states rights. They did this for the right to maintain slavery. Because they fear Lincoln is going to free their slaves and they have billions of dollars invested in slaves. This is, is, is uh, tied to their wealth. OK, so let's continue here. Um, so they're going to elect Jefferson Davis, white supremacist slave owner, Jefferson Davis from Mississippi uh, as their president okay, of the Confederacy. And they began organizing an independent government modeled after the U.S. Constitution with caveats guaranteeing slavery. And on April 12th, 1861, at Fort Sumter in South Carolina, the Confederacy began fighting to assert its independence when Confederate troops fired on Fort Sumter uh, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, the Charleston, South Carolina Harbor. Now, soon after this, the states Arkansas, North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, and Virginia are going to join the Confederacy as well. So in the Civil War, you're going to have 620,000 soldiers who are killed, approximately 2.4 million served, somewhere around 180, around 186,000 or so. Some sources say 200,000 uh, African-Americans are going to serve in uh, the U.S. Civil War uh, as well. OK, and if you read the article from. Uh, let me see if we look at the one dealing with which one is this from the okay we look at the one the earliest memorial day uh dealing with african americans uh from history.com you have that one they have uh, some good information in there and then also uh let's pull up the one from uh, the other one from history.com dealing with um, the history of Memorial Day. Let me see. I think they have this in here as well. Just a sec. I want to pull this up. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where is that? I want to see which article had that information in. Okay. Um, if we look at the one from, just to give you uh, some sources, because I have a number of different sources. I'm referring to my notes 
and I have a number of different sources here. If you look at the one from uh, time.com, time.com, and I just got a subscription to time because they kept telling me to subscribe. So I just got a one year subscription for $15. Uh, that's all we you'll see me quoting a whole lot of articles in time now because to get my money's worth out. But anyway, <laughs> um, they talk about uh, approximately 620,000 soldiers died uh, in the U.S. Civil War, about two thirds from disease, about two thirds from disease. OK. So read this article from uh, Time dot com also the overlooked black history of uh, Memorial Day. Now, this photo right here, this is a picture. Let me make sure this is up on the screen share. This photo right here. Just a second. There's a clip playing. This photo right here is from April 1865. It's a photo of the graves of Union soldiers buried at the race course turned a uh, Confederate prison where historians believe the earliest Memorial Day ceremony took place, okay, in uh, 18, uh, uh, May 1st, 1865. They believe it took place there. Uh, this photo right here. All right, let's continue. Okay, so... Uh, I want to go back to my notes for this. So, yes, yeah, 620,000 killed uh, in the U.S. Civil War, about 2.4 million served. And General Joseph E. Johnston handed over the last Confederate Army to General uh, William T. Sherman near Durham, North Carolina, on April 26, uh, 1865. So the Civil War is coming to an end now. Harvard uh, University, uh, um, uh, David, uh, David Blight, uh, historian from Yale University, was in a Harvard University library during research for uh, a book called Reunion and Race. And this is a, this was in about 1996, about 1996, when he uh, stumbled upon a box containing the paperwork of a. Um, he stumbled upon a box containing the uh, paperwork of a union veterans organization and a folder labeled first decoration day, first decoration day. Now, this information found uh, found there led him to South Carolina's former Washington race course and jockey club. OK, Washington race course and jockey club, which was a prestigious horse racing track that was turned into a prison for Union soldiers, all right? So the Confederacy is going to hold Union soldiers at this racetrack turned prison, okay? And, and you're gonna see this take place during the Civil War. They have to find places to hold prisoners, okay? Union troops, Confederate troops, they have to find places to hold uh, prisoners, so they have to uh, have these makeshift prisons, all right? Um, and then if we, I want to flip over here to, uh, the article from, uh, history.com. One of the earliest Memorial Day ceremonies was held by free African-Americans. One of the earliest Memorial Day ceremonies was held by free African-Americans. Also, Snopes.com has some good information, uh, dealing with the origins of, uh, Memorial Day as well. OK, so uh, Yale, Uni Yale University uh, historian David W. Blight came across this information. OK, and he said there was a file labeled First Decoration Day. And inside on a piece of cardboard was a narrative handwritten by an old veteran, plus a date referencing an article in the New York Tribune. The narrative told the essence of the story that I ended up telling in my book of this march on the racetrack in 1865. This march on the racetrack in 1865. So the racetrack in question, and here's a picture of it, the clubhouse at the Charleston racetrack where the 1865 Memorial Day events took place. 
Okay, the racetrack in question was the Washington Race Course and Jockey Club in Charleston, South Carolina. In the late stages of the U.S. Civil War, the Confederate Army transformed the formerly posh country club into a makeshift prison for Union captives. More than 260 Union soldiers died from uh, exposure uh, while being held in the racetrack's open air infield. OK, and the actual numbers here. Uh, it, I had, well, at least in, in one source shows at least 257 died. OK, because I've been researching this for some time. Uh, uh, one source says 250, at least 257 died of exposure. So the uh, their bodies were hastily buried in a mass grave behind uh, the grandstand. OK, the bodies were hastily buried behind a mass grave uh, behind the grandstand in, in, a, in a mass grave behind the grandstands. Now, some 28 African-American workmen went to the site, reburied the union dead properly. Reburied the union dead properly and built a fence, uh, built a high fence around the cemetery. Uh, they whitewashed the fence and built an archway over an entrance. They whitewashed the fence and built an archway over an entrance on which they inscribed the words martyrs of the race course, martyrs of the race course. Then the um, African-American Charlestonians in cooperation white missionary teachers staged an unforgettable parade of 10,000 uh, 10,000 people on the slaveholders race course. Now, if you and, and, and this account, uh, David uh, Blight found in two sources, the New York Tribune and the Charleston Courier, as we talked about uh, at the beginning of, of this broadcast. If you go back and watch the uh, broadcast I did uh, earlier this month, dealing with the uh, Kentucky Derby and how African Americans were the first winners of the Kentucky Derby, Oliver Lewis, and we know we're in the Triple Crown season, okay? Uh, so the Triple Crown, the three most coveted races in horse racing, the Triple Crown consists of the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont Stakes. 910 a.m. the Superstation WFDF is going to air the Belmont Stakes on uh, June 5th. Um, also, we'll go to the phone lines in just a minute here. They're going to air, air the Belmont Stakes on um, on June 5th. And um, I'll bring up the uh, actual information here. But those are the three coveted races um, in horse racing. In African-Americans, we were running one of all those races. We know the first Kentucky Derby was ran. Um, in 1875, uh, 1875, and it was it was won by an African American man who was 19 years old named Oliver Lewis. Okay, it was ran in May 1875. Uh, 9 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF is going to air the Belmont Horse Race on Saturday, June 5th, 2021, 5 p.m. to 7:18 p.m. 5 p.m. to 7:18 p.m. Uh, so you can uh, listen uh, on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. You can also download the um, the iHeartRadio app and uh, search for 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. You can listen to the uh, Belmont uh, Stakes Horse Race. All right. Let's continue. So you see all this history is connected. And we know a lot of the first jockeys, the, uh, horse racing, we see goes back to slavery. and even in England, we see them, um, the wealthy uh, being involved in horse racing. But a lot of the first jockeys in this country are going to be African-American male slaves. All right. And we see this carry over into who's winning the Kentucky Derby. Uh, 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 Jimmy Wink Wingfield and uh, uh, Isaac uh, Murray and um, uh, Alonzo Lonnie Clayton, a lot of uh, uh, 13 of the 15 jockeys who ran in that first Kentucky Derby in 1875 were African-American jockeys. And we got pushed out of horse racing, just like uh, the real history of 
the first decoration day or the first Memorial Day has been hidden and suppressed, just like for 50 years, the history of the Tulsa race massacre was hidden and suppressed. OK, for a long time, the dominance of African-American jockeys in horse racing was hidden and suppressed as well. OK, so we have to resurrect this history. We have to remember we have to put these pieces back together, just as the 13 pieces of a SARS body or Cyrus's body were put back together, as we talked about in our uh, Saturday class this past Saturday, just as they were put back together and he was resurrected. We have to do the same thing with this history. OK, uh, let's go quickly to the phone lines. Uh, let's go to line one. We have uh, Teddy on line one. Teddy, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Tell us where you're calling from. Oh, you come from Montgomery, Alabama. OK. That's where the Montgomery bus boycott took place. But go ahead. Go ahead. What'd you say? When did it become established as a holiday? Yeah. Well, um, we see it. We, we okay. Okay, so 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 just just for the sake of time, hold on. So just for the sake of time, because we're about to run out of time here. We're on live radio. Uh, back at that time, uh, by by 1890, most states had their own. By 1890, most states were celebrating their own uh, decoration day. It was still being commemorated on May 30th at that time. Okay, uh, it hadn't switched to the last Monday in May. That uh, is signed into law in 1971. OK, the Uniform Holiday Act. So it was probably uh, May 30th. OK, uh, it's probably May 30th at that time. Uh, you're going to have a large Ku Klux Klan influence. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan instigated uh, the 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 sentiments and things like that. Um, so, you know, you, you have to understand, you, you probably had some uh white people coming from outside of Tulsa but you had enough inside Tulsa to do the damage okay because you, you had a rising um you had a rising force in the Ku Klux Klan okay uh you had about a thousand Klan members there in uh Oklahoma I can't remember if it was exactly Tulsa they had a thousand but you're going to have a rising number of Ku Klux Klan members uh also okay but the the the, the memorial day or the decoration day that that ain't what really set this stuff off this stuff was brewing with Tulsa and this goes back to the uh red summer of 1919 two years prior when uh this uh when the after the uh World War One and you had 25 major race rides across this country. When these white men come back home from, the, from serving in the military, they can't find jobs. And the jobs are being filled by African-Americans and uh, immigrants who were here. And you're going to have this, this these racial tensions uh, explode with 25 major race rides in 1919. And also at the same time, you had the great pandemic, the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 taking place, which went into 1919 also. All right. 
uh and and you're going to have these white men who who are upset because they can't find jobs and then you have these these this wealth in north tulsa and black wall street okay and the ku klux klan is going to instigate uh these tensions we're going to talk about this more on uh tuesday show all right because it's also suspected that the attack was planned uh the way all the, the way all this came together it's also suspected that this attack was planned as well but it's important for us to understand and you call, call back uh tomorrow uh, tomorrow show we're here uh monday through friday 11 p.m to 12 midnight Eastern standard time it's important to understand that we rebuilt black wall street after the 1921 tulsa race massacre by 1926, it was thriving. Dr. W.B. Dubois visits and writes about how it's thriving again. We rebuilt it. It's prosperous in, in the 1950s and 1960s. It's going to be the expressways that come through starting in about 1970. Uh, uh, Interstate 244 and U.S. 75 freeway, they're going to come through and, dish, and wipe out businesses. Uh, homes are going to be taken. African-American homes are, are going to be taken by eminent domain. So after we rebuilt, Black Wall Street is prosperous again. And some accounts are that it was better than the first time, but the expressways are going to come through and destroy it. Okay. That's federal dollars. That's federal dollars. All right. Those watching on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. Keep watching. Uh, we're going to keep broadcasting for a few more minutes. We're out of time here on that. And then the superstation WFDF. Right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of fair. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right, stand by. Uh, we're going to keep going. How's everybody doing? If you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us, helps us to keep uh, helps us to keep broadcasting six days a week. Keep doing the research, pay some of the bills, etc. All right. Also, I'll be in. Atlanta, uh, June 18th through the 20th for the uh, Juneteenth Festival. Okay, the Juneteenth uh, uh, Parade, uh, Atlanta Parade and Music Festival at Centennial Park, ninth annual uh, Juneteenth Festival, Centennial Olympic Park, um, uh, Friday, June 18th through Sunday, June 20th. Okay, I'll be doing uh, presentations there. I'm speaking Saturday. And uh, Sunday at the uh, amphitheater. And I also have a vendor booth there as well. OK, uh, the Juneteenth Festival. So be sure to check me out there. Visit the website. Uh, visit the website JuneteenthATL.com. JuneteenthATL.com. And let me pull this up here. Uh, let me go over to this just a second. Yeah, visit the website June uh, JuneteenthATL.com uh, for more information. They're going to have um, headliners and national speakers. Uh, they have uh, they usually have about a hundred plus vendors, African American vendors, uh, Caribbean vendors, uh, African vendors uh, there. Uh, I talked to Bob Johnson, the organizer, not Bob Johnson for BET, but another Bob Johnson. Uh, so he said Angie Stone is going to be performing again uh, this year. So uh, check that out. We'll, we'll post this information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. But you can visit that website, JuneteenthATL.com, JuneteenthATL.com for more information. All right. And it's uh, it's uh, also free. It's a free event, free and open to the public. Be sure to come out, support African-American vendors, uh, African-American businesses. Also, look out for the African History Network uh, there as well. All right. Let's continue. OK, everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. All right, let's continue. For those who are just joining, joining us, uh, we're dealing with the hidden uh, African-American origin of Memorial Day. So we see the clubhouse at the race course where Union soldiers were killed. 
This is in 1865 in Charleston, South Carolina. All right, let me bring this back up. Okay, so let's continue. So you saw uh, black Charlestonians, African-American Charlestonians in cooperation with white missionaries and teachers staged an unforgettable parade of uh, 10,000 uh, people on the slaveholders race course, 10,000 people on the slaveholders race course. And do you you have to understand there was probably a great sense of pride for these African Americans to be able to do this on their former slaveholders race course because the race course was a symbol of wealth of the aristocracy. It was a symbol of southern wealth. Okay, and uh, you know during during slavery, a lot of African American boys um or young men were forced to be jockeys and it can be something dangerous you had you know cases where they were killed were injured uh being jockeys okay so it's probably a great sense of pride for them to be able to have this uh march on a symbol of wealth that uh uh the white aristocracy had in the south you also had three thousand uh, black children who carried bouquets of flowers and sang John Brown's body. Members of the famed 54th Massachusetts and other uh, black union regiments were in attendance and performed double time marches. Black ministers recited uh, verses from the Bible as well. And I'm going to flip back over to this article here from history.com, which deals with one of the earliest uh, Memorial Days, one of the earliest Memorial Days. And then we see uh, the Battle of Fort Wagner on Morris Island in the 54th Regiment. Uh, this is a Union attack took place July 18th, 1863, led by the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Now, if the new Whose reports are accurate, the 1865 gathering at the Charleston racetrack uh, would be the earliest Memorial Day commemoration on record. Uh, David Blight, historian David Blight, excitedly called the Avery Institute of Afro-American History and Culture at the College of Charleston looking for more information on the historic event. He said, I've never uh, heard of it, they told me, uh, said David Blight. Uh, this never happened. But it was clear from the newspaper reports that a Memorial Day observance was organized by freed slaves in Charleston at least a year before other U.S. cities and three years before the first national observance. How had uh, how had this been lost to history for over a century? How had this been lost to history for over a century? David Blight said this was a story that had really been suppressed both in the local memory and certainly the national memory. But nobody who had witnessed it could ever have forgotten it. Nobody who had witnessed it could ever have forgotten it. Now, David Blight kept digging for more information, but the only other mention he found of the racetrack event was in a 1916 correspondence sent from a woman's a women's civil war historical society in New Orleans to its sister chapel in Charleston, South Carolina, asking about a big parade of freed slaves on a horse track at the end of the war. Quote, I regret that I was unable to gather any official information in answer to this, wrote the Charleston Society's president. I regret that I was unable to gather any official information in answer to this. Now, David Blight said, that's such a telling statement. 
the woman who wrote the letter may not may not have known about it, but the fact that she didn't tells the story. OK, so there was appears uh, to be a concerted effort. To uh, suppress this history, it appears there was a concerted effort to suppress this history. Now, I'm, I'm referring to my notes here because I have um, I have six pages of notes and I, I'm citing different sources. So after 50 years after the Civil War ended, someone at the United Daughters of the Confederacy asked the Ladies Memorial Association of Charleston to confirm that May 1st, 1865 tribute occurred and received a, a reply from S.C. Beckwith, the initials S.C. S.C. Beckwith. Quote, I regret that I was unable to gather any official information uh, in answer to this, end quote. Uh, so this is who responded to, uh, David Blight. Okay. Uh, S C Beckwith. Now, whether Beckwith actually knew about the tribute or not, David Blight argues the exchange il illustrates quote, how white Charlestonians suppressed from memory this founding end quote. And let me, okay. okay I think that's from the time magazine. Article. Hold on. Just, just bear with me. Cause I have like four or five different sources. I have, six pages of notes and it's typed up okay i have six pages of notes dealing with uh dealing with this history so i want to i want to go to the actual citation for this to show you this here so just give me just bear with me here for a minute uh this would be down here this is from this article from time magazine and this would be S.C. Beckwith right here. OK, let's go to this because I like to be precise with um, the history as much as possible. But since I have the citation in front of me, I want to go actually to it. OK, right here. Uh, uh, about 50 years after the Civil War ended, this is from the Time uh, magazine article um, entitled the Overlook Black History of Memorial Day. The Overlook Black History of Memorial Day. About 50 years after the Civil War ended, someone at the United Daughters of the Confederacy asked the Ladies Memorial Association of Charleston, South Carolina, to confirm that the May 1st, 1865 tribute occurred and received a reply from one S.C. Beckwith. S.C. Beckwith. Quote, I regret that I was unable to gather any official information in answer to this. End quote. Now, whether S.C. Beckwith actually knew about the tribute or not, David Blight, historian David Blight from Yale University, argues the exchange illustrates, quote, how white Charlestonians suppressed from memory this founding. How white Charlestonians suppressed from memory this founding now a 1937 book also incorrectly stated that james redpath single-handedly organized the tribute when it really was a group effort so it appears you know they just they're just jacking the history and just giving one white man credit for what many African-Americans did. A 1937 book also incorrectly stated that James Redpath single handedly organized a tribute when it was really a group effort and that it took place on uh, May 30th when it actually they said it took place on May 30th. But it actually took place on May 1st, 1865 and what African-Americans organized. OK, now that book also diminished the role of the African-Americans involved by referring to them as, quote, black hands, which only knew that they that the dead they were honoring had raised them from a condition of servitude. OK, they were so they're referring to Union soldiers, at least 257 dead Union soldiers. OK, this 
uh, 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 this book diminished the role of the African Americans involved by referring to them as quote black hands, which only knew that the dead they were honoring had raised them from a condition of servitude. End quote. Now the origin, the origin story that did stick involves a 1868 call from General John A. Logan, president of a Union Army veterans group that we talked about earlier, urging Americans to decorate the graves of the fallen with flowers on May 30th of that year. So that was May 30th, 1868. The ceremony that took place in Arlington National Cemetery that day has been considered the first official Memorial Day celebration. But what African-Americans did May 1st, 1865, got lost in history, got suppressed. Now, Memorial Day became a national holiday two decades later in 1889 and took a century before it was moved in 1968 to the last Monday of May, where it remains today. That, that, uh, that goes back to the 1971 Uniform Holiday Act, the Uniform Holiday Act of 1971. According to historian David Blight, Hampton Park, named after Confederate General, General Wade Hampton, replaced the grave site at the Martyrs of the Race Course, and the graves were re-entered uh, re in the 1880s at a national cemetery in Beaufort, South Carolina. The fact that freed slaves, free African slaves, Memorial Day tribute is not as well remembered is emblematic of the struggle that would follow as African Americans fight to be fully recognized for their contributions to American society continues to this day. The fact that the Freed Slaves Memorial Day tribute is not as well remembered is emblematic of the struggle that would follow as African-Americans fight to be fully recognized for their contributions to American, to American society continues today. All right. So we have that history, and that's from time.com. Uh, I'm just I'm looking through my sources. I'm looking through the rest of my notes here. Um, okay, so we basically got that. We got that martyrs of the race course. We got that. Um, Snopes.com has some information that goes a little deeper into this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to uh, my notes on this here. Snope because um, I looked at Snopes.com a few years ago. And that fact checking and tracing this information. So we're going to go, uh, I'm going to flip over to that. So just a second here. All right. How's everybody doing? Everybody share this broadcast. On your social media platforms, invite your friends to tune in as well. Uh, then the first article uh, I saw dealing with this history, I think this was the first article, it's from the root.com. The root.com, and this is one of the sources for my notes also. Memorial Day, blacks were first to celebrate, scholar says. Memorial Day, blacks were first to celebrate, scholar says. This article is from May 27th, 2011. May 27th, 2011. And it talks about uh, Yale history professor David Blight and the research he was doing and coming across uh, this information um, and um, coming across a folder labeled uh, First Decoration Day. OK, so this is the first article, if I remember correctly, that I saw dealing with uh, this history. And then year after year, you, you start having a little bit more. Uh, history coming out. Time Magazine wrote their article uh, May 2020. And then the one from uh, history.com dealing with uh, one of the earliest 
one of the earliest Memorial Day ceremonies was held by freed African Americans. That article was was not written till uh, 2019. So I, I, each year I would read the regular uh, article they have dealing with Memorial Day history and left out the African American influence. They wrote this one here uh, originally May 24th, 2019, and it's updated May 10th, 2020. So the root.com was far ahead of the history channel, um, history.com, dealing with the African-American roots of uh, Memorial Day. Then Black America Web picked this up, uh, 2011, 2012, news1.com. They all, all had articles, but they were far ahead of uh, history.com. Okay, let me... Uh, flip back over here to my notes for just a second. I want to get through the rest of this. So this deals with more research from uh, David Blight, uh, historian David Blight. Uh, let's see here. So this deals with the first decoration day, uh, May 1st, 1865 in South Carolina. Uh, African-Americans founded decoration day at a graveyard of 257 Union soldiers mar uh, labeled Martyrs of the Race Course, May 1st, 1865 in Charleston, South Carolina. The first decoration day as this event came to be recognized in some circles in the north involved an estimated 10,000 people, most of them Af uh, most of them uh, uh, former slaves. Uh, during April of 1865, uh, 28 African-American men from one of the local churches built a suitable enclosure for the burial ground at the race course. In some 10 days, they constructed a fence 10 feet high, enclosing the burial ground and landscape the graves into neat rows. And let me, I want to go back to that picture of the um, photo of the graves. And I think we have it. Uh, that's the racetrack. The article from Time Magazine shows the um, shows the graves here. What happened? Okay, the article from uh, Time Magazine shows the graves. I'm going to flip back over to that. Okay. An April 1865 photo of the graves of Union soldiers buried at the race course turned Confederate prison where historians believe the earliest Memorial Day ceremony took place. All right, so uh, during an April uh, 1865, during April 1865, 28 African American men from one of the local churches built a suitable enclosure for the burial ground at the race course. In some 10 days, they constructed a fence 10 feet high, enclosing the burial ground, and landscaped the uh, graves into neat rows. They lands landscaped the graves into neat rows. The wooden fence was whitewashed and an archway was built over the gate to the enclosure. On the arch painted in black letters, the workmen inscribed martyrs of the race course, martyrs of the race course.
Now, at 9 o'clock, uh, 9 a.m. in the morning on May 1st, 1865, the procession to this special cemetery began as 3,000 African-American school children newly enrolled in Freedmen's Schools, the Freedmen's Schools organized by the Freedmen Bureau, the U.S. Bureau of Freedmen, uh, Refugees, and Abandoned Lands. They marched around the race course, each with an armload of roses and singing the song, John Brown's Body, John Brown's Body. The children were followed by 300 African-American women representing the Patriotic Association, a group organized to distribute clothing and other goods among the freed people. See, we had all types of organizations during slavery and after slavery that supported our people. You've heard me talk about the, the cooperatives, the co-ops, the Free African Society, different, different cooperatives that we had to uh, help our people. We had them during slavery and we had them after slavery as well. OK, I'm going to uh, flip over to this other picture here of the clubhouse. Let's go to this one here. OK, so this is the uh, clubhouse at the race course where Union soldiers were held prison prisoners. OK, this is a. Uh, the, the the course course house at the race uh, at the racetrack the clubhouse at the racetrack I should say all right so the and I'm gonna grab uh Dr. Jessica Gordon Nimhard's book right here collective courage because this ties into the information of her book, Collective Courage, A History of African-American Cooperative Economic Thought and Practice, Collective Courage by Dr. Jessica Gordon M. Hart, which deals with the history of these co-ops that we have, cooperative economics. Cooperative economics does not mean capitalism dressed up in red, black, and green. That's not cooperative economics, okay? I'm not attacking capitalism, I'm just saying. Um, see, one of the problems is, is that when you when you go study even in Black Wall Street, Green the Greenwood District, we had cooperatives. We had cooperatives all throughout our history. Whether you're talking about the Colored Merchants Association, uh, founded in about 1928, coming out of the National Negro Business League, founded by Booker T. Washington in about 1900. Whether you talk about the the Colored Farmers Union, 1886 in Texas, it grew to have about 1.2 million members. Whether you talk about the Free African Society going back to 1787, all these different cooperatives that we had, we were raising money to bury people. We were raising money during slavery. You had cooperatives that were raised money to buy people out of slavery, to buy people's freedoms, but buy people's freedom. We and and the cooperatives, uh, a lot of these uh, organizations we formed, the members were part owners. One of the most popular type of cooperative is a credit union. In a credit union, the members who have accounts, bank accounts, things like this, credit union accounts, they're also owner, part owners of the credit union, okay? Um, and one of the things that happened was that African-Americans went to white business schools or went to business schools, possibly at an HBCU that taught white business principles. And we basically learned white capitalism, not cooperative economics. And then we bought, and then we brought these white business principles back to the African American community to try to implement them. They may work for you and your family, but they don't have the real benefit that the cooperatives had historically. The, that concept of the cooperatives are concepts we brought with us to this country from Africa. Those are African concepts. And when you break up the cooperatives, you break up the cooperation. When you break up the cooperatives, you break up the cooperation between African-Americans largely. And you're using white business principles. OK, and that doesn't work for us historically. It may work for you and your family, but it doesn't benefit the community. It doesn't have the same benefit that the cooperatives had. So Dr. Jessica Gordon-Nemhard 
breaks all this stuff down in her book, Collective Courage. Okay, I just don't have time to get into this because we, we're done with this topic right now. Uh, but I've talked about this before in the past, and I interviewed her back in about 2014. So it's archived. Just Google my name or her name. Uh, or when you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, click on Listen to Podcasts and uh, go back to 2014. And um, we, have, we have like a thousand podcasts uh, archived at the uh, Blog Talk Radio, blogtalkradio.com forward slash the African History Network show. All right. So the uh, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on social media platforms. I hope you're learning something because this is a lot of work. The the children were followed by 300 African-American women representing the Patriotic Association, a group organized to distribute clothing and other goods among the freed people, the former slaves. OK, the freed people. The women carried baskets of flowers, reeds and crosses to the burial ground. The Mutual Aid Society, this is another cooperative that we had, the Mutual Aid Society, a benevolent association of African-American men next marched in, in cadence around the track and into the cemetery, followed by large groups of white and African-American citizens. All dropped their spring blossoms on the graves in a scene recorded by a newspaper correspondent who said, when all had left, the holy mounds, the tops, the sides, and the spaces between them were one mass of flowers. Not a speck of earth could be seen. And as the breeze wafted the sweet perfumes from them outside and beyond, there were few eyes among the uh, among those who knew the meaning of the ceremony that were not dim with tears of joy. There were few eyes among them, among those who knew the meaning of the ceremony that were not dim with tears of joy. End quote. OK, this was a uh, uh, account from a newspaper correspondent who was there. While the adults marched around the graves, the children were gathered in a nearby grove where they sang America, the song America, and also will rally around the flag. And they sang the Star Spangled Banner. They probably ain't know a white supremacist named Francis Scott Key wrote it in uh, 1814. They probably didn't know that during the War of 1812, but OK, I understand. You you newly freed and you are just happy. I I, I trust, trust me. I I'm not beating up I, I beating up on them. I understand. Okay. The official dedication ceremony was conducted by the ministers of all the African American churches in Charleston, South Carolina, with prayer, the reading of biblical passages, and the singing of spirituals. African American Charlestonians gave birth to an American tradition. African-American Charlestonians gave birth to an American tradition. In so doing, they declared the meaning of the war in the most public way possible by their labor. There were the Civil War, the, the U.S. Civil War. They declared the meaning of the U.S. Civil War in the in the most public way possible. Their labor, their words, their songs and their solemn parade of roses, lilacs and marching feet on the old planters race course on the old planters race course. So once again, the race course was a symbol of the, of Southern wealth built on the backs of African people because it was African American jockeys that were racing those horses. And it was many African Americans who were trainers of the horses and tended to the horses, the things like this. So it was a symbol of the wealth of the confederacy okay so i can imagine the pride that they had to be able to march on the race course that was a symbol of the uh aristocracy a symbol of uh, of the confederacy and this also symbolizing the defeat of the confederacy as well the defeat of their former slave masters now after the dedication the crowds gathered at the race course grandstand to hear some 30 speeches by union officers 
local African-American ministers and abolitionist missionaries. Pick, uh, cook, um, uh, picnics, where well, they, they say picnics, uh, outings, uh, cookouts ensued around the grounds. And in the afternoon, a full brigade of Union infantry included colored troops marched in double column around the around the martyrs graves and held a drill on the infield of the race course the war was over and memorial day had been founded by african americans in a ritual of remembrance and consecration in a ritual of remembrance and consecration I want to bring up this picture here of African American uh, Union soldiers. Now, although contemporaneous accounts from the Charleston Daily Courier describe and document the 1865 ceremony that took place there, and the event uh, was one of the earliest known observances similar to what we would now recognize as Memorial Day, whether it was truly the first ceremony and, and what influence, if any, it might have had on later observances are still a matter of contention. Professor Blight termed it the first Memorial Day and appears to be the first Memorial Day. Uh, this was, a, um, I forgot which year to see this from Snopes.com, but it appears to be, this, this, this took place before um, uh, the one in 1868, but it's not clear that the one May 1st, 1865 influenced the one, uh, uh, in May 1868 that General Logan called for. It's not clear that there's a connection between the two, but the one in 1865 took place first. Uh, Professor David Blight termed it the first Memorial Day because it predated most of the other contenders, but he noted he has no evidence that it led to General Logan's call for a national holiday in 1868. Quote, I'm much more interested in the meaning that's being conveyed in that incredible ritual than who's first, uh, end quote, David Blight said, historian David Blight said, but African-Americans did it first, though. Okay, uh, it, now when we look at the evolution of Memorial Day, Memorial Day as Decoration Day gradually came to be known, originally honored only those who, who lost their lives while fighting in the Civil War. But during World War I, the United States found itself embroiled, embroiled in another major conflict, and the holiday evolved to commemorate American military personnel who died in all wars, including World War II, the Vietnam War, the Korean War, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. For decades, Memorial Day continued to be observed on May 30th, the date that General Logan had selected for the first Decoration Day. But as I said, in, in 1968, Congress passed what's known as the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, which established Memorial Day as the last Monday in May in order to create a three-day weekend for federal employees, the change went into effect in 1971. The same law also declared Memorial Day as a federal holiday. When we look at Memorial Day traditions, we see cities and towns across the United States, not across the United States, host Memorial Day parades each year, often incorporating military personnel and members of veterans, uh, veterans organizations. Some of the largest parades take place in Chicago, New York, and Washington, D.C., Americans also observe uh, Memorial Day by visiting cemeteries and memorials. On a less somber note, uh, many people throw uh, parties and barbecues on the holiday, uh, perhaps because it's, it unofficially marks the beginning of summer. And we know a lot of people were traveling this weekend. I was at the cemetery uh, today to visit the grave sites of my, uh, my aunt and my uncle um, who passed away the past few years. So that is a history of the hidden African-American origins of Memorial Day, the hidden African-American origin of Memorial Day. All right. So there's something else that we created that we only recently started getting credit for. 
But this ties it to how this history is suppressed as well. We saw the history of the Tulsa race massacre was suppressed for at least 50 years. People were threatened for trying to do research. Uh, the uh, white Tulsa newspaper for decades did not write about it. OK, so this is. Uh, why this history is so important, you know, a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. And. We also know historical events don't take place in the vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of uh, events that take place that lead up to a larger event uh, happening as well. All right, be sure to register for the uh, online course that I teach on Saturdays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. It's a nine-week online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the Transatlantic Slave Trade taking place. We, I do the class live. All the sessions are recorded, so you can go back and watch it over and over again if you miss anything. You still have access to the course even after the course is over. Uh, so we do it Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We just posted a link here. Uh, you can register for it as soon as you. So when you scroll down our website, you'll see the information here um, for the online course. Click here to register here. It's on sale, uh, $60, regularly $130, so it's like 54% off. Click right here to enroll. As soon as you enroll, you can start watching the course content. You can watch this past uh, Saturday's class um, also. And you can watch the class that we did with uh, uh, Sister Nubia Wartford, who's an archaeologist. We dealt with the origins of ancient Kush and African queens of antiquity. Uh, we dealt with that a couple Saturdays ago. So as I do a, a PowerPoint presentation, we have book references, articles, video clips. Um, it's it's a ton of information. OK. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class, but you can if you want to get them for your personal library, that's fine. Also, at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, we have uh, the DVD lecture and digital download of my two and a half hour lecture I've, I've done dealing with the history of Black Wall Street. I did this in 2014, Black Wall Street from destruction to the resurrection of economic empowerment. Black Wall Street from destruction to the resurrection of economic empowerment. It's a two and a half hour lecture. I've done dealing with the history of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I did with a timeline of history also le leading up to the uh, attack in 1921. And I deal with the uh, founding of Tulsa by uh, Creek Indians uh, about 1854, because this ties into the history of the uh, Indian Removal Act of 1830 and the Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 and the uh, um, Black Freedmen Indian, Indian Treaties of 1866. All this history is connected. OK, so I'm going to post a link here. Uh, we have that on sale as well. And then all my lectures are available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have bundle packs also. This is uh, Black Wall Street from destruction to the resurrection of economic empowerment. Like I said before, we rebuilt Black Wall Street after the 1921 massacre, but the expressways are going to come through and destroy it really for good. So it used to have like 35, 36 blocks of businesses. Now you have one block. Of black owned businesses. That's what's left there in Greenwood. Uh, also, we have the uh, 15 DVD bundle pack of my lectures, the Michael M. Hotep uh, Black History Month DVD bundle pack. And you click right here, uh, order here, it takes you to the next page. It's not loading properly. There we go. And it shows you what's in the bundle pack. I have three of my lectures dealing with the uh, film Black Panther, uh, which is a a deep movie and incorporates a lot of African culture and language and spiritual systems. Um, we have uh, a presentation I did dealing with the history of Black History Month, African American History Month, breaking the chains while we celebrate Black History Month. I have one dealing with uh, Malcolm X, why is he still relevant uh, 50 years later? One dealing with the distortion of Dr. King's legacy, a uh, presentation on the Three Fifths Compromise of 1787. 
in the history of the Electoral College and how it works, uh, the racist history of the White National Anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, a double lecture that I did with uh, Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. We did a double lecture here in Detroit back in 2013. So you get that as well. So there's a ton of information here. Also, you get Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. So I deal with some well-known and not so well-known African women in our history from all different time periods. Um, this one right here is a really, really good presentation. Uh, African American resistance, resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. Um, that's, uh, I deal with so much in that presentation. Also, this one here, Ancient Kemet, the Winter Solstice, and the History of Christmas. So I deal with the pre-Christian origins of Christmas. Uh, it takes us back to ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Uh, we deal with the Winter Solstice festivals that would, took place on or around December 25th. Uh, also, so that's a, that's a three-hour presentation dealing with the uh, history of Christmas. So that's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. And then this six DVD bundle pack, Black Migration 16, 19, and 2019, we have this in a DVD and digital download format. Uh, so this one, I deal with the uh, history of Juneteenth, the real history of Juneteenth. Uh, that's a three-hour presentation. Uh, also, we have Black Migration 16, 19, to 2019. Black Migration 16, 19, to 2019. We deal with that 400th year anniversary of 1619. I deal with the um, Red Summer 1919. There's a lot of information there. Uh, this presentation here, African Americans, uh, uh, ancient Africans in America before Native Americans, Columbus, or slavery. And let me see which one. Let's go back to, let's go back here. You can probably see it better. And there's a three hour presentation that deals with the little known history of why um, African Americans switched from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And I deal with the Southern strategy of 1928 called the Lily White Movement of 1928, which is an effort to push us out of the Republican Party. And we started slowly going over to the Democratic Party because they were more receptive to our issues, more receptive to our needs. So a lot of people don't know about the Lily White Movement in 1920. They think we switched over because of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. Two thirds of African Americans had already switched over to the uh, Democratic Party by uh, 1960. Two thirds of us had, had already switched over. Okay. And so I deal with that history. That's a three hour presentation. Uh, this one here deals with when black men dominated horse racing and how organized effort forced them out. This deals with the history of African-American jockeys and how we used to dominate horse racing when uh, uh, Kentucky derbies and things like this. And this one here, six principles of political self-defense, understanding how pol uh, public policies and laws affect the economic conditions of African-Americans. That's a deep presentation. There are actually two lectures uh, on that. Um, there are two lectures uh, that you'll get there. Okay, so we posted that here, Black Black Migration 1619 to 2019. We have that in uh, DVD format and digital download format. That's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I have like 40 of my lectures there, okay? And a lot of them we have in digital download format also, okay? We got this one, Ancient Kim at the Winter Solstice and the History of Christmas. So this is all at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, our website. Um, let me see, what was that? And, it, oh, and we're going to post this one here. This deals with, um, I posted Black Migrations, and this is the 15 DVD bundle pack also here. Uh, okay, posted that. Let me post Black Migrations. And uh, we talked about why we switched over from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. A lot of people are commenting on the post that I did uh, a couple of days ago dealing with uh, Malcolm X's speech, uh, The Battle of the Bullet. And let's see, let's pull this up here. Okay. Um, 
as I've said before, uh, Malcolm delivered the ballad of the bullet uh, three times that I know of, uh, March 29th, 1964, and um, April 3rd, 1964, and April 4th, 1964. April 3rd, 1964, Coy Methodist Baptist Church in um, Cleveland, Ohio. And April 4th, 1964, in Detroit, King Solomon's Baptist Church in Detroit. A lot of people quote Malcolm. I hear people quote the speech, but they haven't read the entire speech. And you have to study the trajectory of Malcolm's life to really understand the speech also and what was taking place at that time as well. Read all three versions of it. But the, the first one, uh, March 29th, 1964, the Washington Heights, New York. That, that may be the, one of the most important ones right there. Uh, and then you have to read Malcolm's speech um, by enemies necessary, June 28th, uh, 1964. That's after he comes back from Mecca. The Battle of the Bullet was before he went to Mecca. Okay. It's, it's late uh, March 64. And it's uh, right after he separ officially separates from the nation of Islam. He officially separates from the nation of Islam um, March 8th, 1964. Okay. If we look at this here, I'm going to pull this up. We'll look at this briefly, then we have to get out of here. Number one, in the speech, Malcolm X uses the term African-Americans. So uh, for some reason, people think that Reverend Jesse Jackson invented the term African-American, which he did not. And I, I've said that before. I'm going to flip over here to this post that I did. You also have to read the book Martin Malcolm in America, A Dream or a Nightmare by James H. Cone. To really, really understand this. OK, so I did this post. Uh, it's actually uh, it's actually early Monday morning, twelve thirty a.m. Monday morning, May thirty first. And some of you all saw this post that I did. Let me see; he's got four hundred twenty seven likes so far. But I said, let me try to blow this up some more. Uh, Malcolm X, The Battle of the Bullet, March 29, 1964. Notice Malcolm X used the term African-American in this speech. Uh, Malcolm is an excerpt from the speech. This is toward the end of it. Uh, we want to make them, we want to make them pass the strongest civil rights bill they ever passed. Because we know that even after they pass it, they can't enforce it. In order now, this is before the civil rights bill passed. Okay, this is before June. This is before the civil rights workers, the three civil rights workers, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney, were killed. Even though in the TV show, um, even though in the TV show uh, Godfather of Harlem, they show all this stuff taking place at the same time, it didn't. Malcolm delivered the Ballad of the Bullet first uh, uh, th uh, three months before Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were killed. OK, he delivered this. He delivered it first, March 29th, 1964. Right. Gilman Schwann and Cheney were killed June 21st, 1964. He delivered this speech three months before they were killed. And uh, June 21st, 1964 is a week before Malcolm delivers his speech by any means necessary, uh, announcing the formation of of the organization of Afro-American unity. And he uses that phrase by any means necessary in that speech. That's June 28th, 1964, where he lays out the five platforms of the organization of Afro-American unity. Okay, so I love I like Godfather of Harlem, but they're playing with the timelines. They're playing with too much of this too much. Also, um, when Malcolm delivers the Battle of the Bullet, it's before he goes to Mecca, he's clean shaven. Okay, like he is in this picture here, he's clean shaven. They show him doing the battle of the bullet with a goatee he he starts wearing the facial hair after he goes to mecca he leaves for mecca late april 64 so there's this little 
um, things, if you're a historian, you can see little inaccuracies, historical inaccuracies in what they're doing and they're conflating timelines together. But anyway, hopefully it'll cause people to start doing like historical research. Um, yeah, too much creative license. So in the speech, Malcolm says, we want to make them pass the strongest civil rights bill they ever passed because we know that even after they pass it, they can't enforce it. Now here Malcolm's talking about registering people to vote and organize. If anybody tells you Malcolm was against voting, that damn lie. They haven't studied Malcolm. Malcolm was not against voting. He's talking about voting strategically and pushing your issues and getting something tangible for your vote. Malcolm was not against voting. OK, and this is Malcolm after he leaves the nation, when he speak, when he can freely speak for himself. In order to do this, Malcolm goes on to say, in order to do this, we're starting a voters registration drive. We have to get everybody in Harlem registered, not as a Democrat or Republicans, but registered as independents. We're going to organize a core of brothers and sisters who after this city is mapped, who after this city is mapped out, we're going to organize a core of brothers and sisters who after this city is mapped out, they won't leave one apartment house door not knocked on. They won't be, there won't be a door in Harlem that will not have been knocked on to see that whatever black face lives behind that door is registered to vote by a certain time this year. And actually, we can go over to um, I have the text of the speech pulled up. We can go over, flip over to that. Well, let me see. Hold on. Let me see what I have here. I think I signed this. OK. Malcolm is bound to the bullets. OK. Uh, we can flip over to the text of the speech. You scroll down last two paragraphs. Okay, we, we have to uh, get everybody in Harlem registered, not as a Democrat or Republicans, but registered as independent. We're going to organize a core of brothers and sisters who, after this city is mapped out, they won't leave one apartment house. Uh, they won't leave one apartment house uh, door not knocked on. Uh, there won't be a door in Harlem that will not have been knocked on to see that whatever black face lives behind that door is registered to vote by a certain time this year. Nobody will have an excuse not to be registered. We'll ask him to let us see your card. If you don't have the sense of responsibility to get registered, we'll move you out of town. It's going to be the ballot or the bullet. This is uh, March 29th, 1964, okay? You can read the uh, text of the speech here. Uh, this is at uh, vlib.us. You can just search for uh, Malcolm X Battle of the Bullet, March 29th, 1964 to come up. OK, you can read the text of the speech. Also on YouTube, they have. Five minutes of the speech from March 29th, 1964. Uh, the, the beginning of the speech, Malcolm used to term African-Americans. This is what I'm trying to explain. I don't know where people got this, that Jesse Jackson. Created the term African-American and invented the term African-American. He reintroduced the term African-American. We've talked about that before. Earliest recorded uses of the term African-American dates back to May 15, 1782 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. New York Times has articles dealing with this. I don't know why people keep perpetuating this myth like Willie Lynch. Willie Lynch never historically existed. People keep talking about the Willie Lynch letter of 1712. Willie Lynch never historically existed. And the letter has been proven to be a fraud. Uh, he used the term African-Americans so-called Negroes. He said one of the reasons that is bad for us to continue to just refer to ourselves as so-called Negroes, that's negative, okay? When we say so-called Negro, that's pointing out what we weren't, what we aren't, but it isn't telling us what we are. We are Africans and we happen to be in America, 
okay? We're not Americans. We're Africans who were formerly uh, kidnapped, okay? Uh, our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock landed on us. Now, he's partly correct. Because, as we talked about here, and you've heard my interviews with Dr. David M. Hotel, if you read the first Americans or Africans documented evidence, you know the African people are the original Americans. I understand what Malcolm was talking about. He's talking about the government, things like this. African people are the original Americans. We've been in this land at least 51,700 years before Native Americans came into existence. And when you go to the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary, and you look up the term American, it clearly tells you American referred to the aboriginal or copper colored races that were here before. Th this is who Europeans found when they got here, when they got to the Americas, the aboriginal copper colored races. Well, those were African people and Native Americans who were here when Europeans got here. So the term American originally did not refer to Europeans. It referred to who they found in the Americas when they got here. Well, who was that? So the original Americans are African people. Europeans are not the original Americans. Um, let's go to this here. Let me, let me pull this up from YouTube. Um, Facebook may flag me, hopefully not, but Here is, can we, uh, let me pull up, I'm going to pull up um, the Battles of the Bullet. Because I found it on, uh, on YouTube, it's uh, about five minutes I found on YouTube. I was looking at it uh, today. How's everybody doing, uh, watching us on YouTube as well? How you all like this type of information? African Americans, or so-called Negro. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that it is bad for us to continue to just refer to ourselves as so-called Negro, that's negative. When we say so-called Negro, that's pointing out what we aren't, but it isn't telling us what we are. We are African, and we happen to be in America. We're not American. We are people who formerly were Africans who were kidnapped and brought to America. We... Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. We were brought here against our will. We were not brought here to be made citizens. We were not brought here to enjoy the uh, constitutional gifts that they speak so beautifully about today. And because we weren't brought here to be made citizens today, now that we've become awakened to some degree and we begin to ask for those things which they say are supposedly for Americans, they look upon us with hostility and unfriendliness. So our unwanted presence, the fact that we are unwanted, is becoming magnified in all of America's preachments today. In the United Nations, you have poor nations and rich nations. They say that the most powerful block in the UN are the African Asian, is the African Asian block. These are the poor nations, yet they carry more weight in, a, uh, in this political body than the nations do who have all the money. Why? Because no matter how wealthy America is, she only has one vote. No matter how wealthy Russia is, she only has one vote. Whereas all the poor nations in Africa who have just emerged into independence, they have each a vote too. And they stick together and, and are able to outmaneuver the rich nations. This is and by, by having independence, and the right to vote in the political world body, it has enabled the dark nations to band together and use the strength of their ballot to force the wealthy nations, which are the white nations, 
into giving more independence to other nations who are still under their jurisdiction. You and I have to look at this and understand this, that the ballot is as powerful as the bullet. Now, if you and I leave it up to the moderate Negro leaders, they'll be able to trick it up and make the world think that they passed something that doesn't really mean anything. So what you and I have got to do is get involved. You and I have to be right there breathing down their throat. Every time they look over their shoulder, we want them to see us. We want to make them, we want to make them pass the strongest civil rights bill they've ever passed. Because we know even after they pass it, they can't enforce it. In order to do this, we're starting a, a voter's registration drive. We have to get everybody in Harlem registered. Not as Democrats or Republicans, but registered as independents. We're going to organize a core of brothers and sisters who, after the city is mapped out, they won't leave one apartment house door not knocked on. There won't be a door in Harlem that will not have been knocked on to see that whatever black face lives behind that door is registered to vote by a certain time this year. Nobody will have an excuse not to be registered. We'll ask him, let us see your card. If you don't have the uh, sense of responsibility to get registered, we'll move you out of town. <laughs> It's going to be the ballot or the bullet. After we get our people registered, we can then organize that voting strength and channel it in the direction that will get immediate results for the benefit of our people. We can sweep our enemies right out of office, but we will not be able to do it sitting around talking about select and elect your own candidates. All right. So that's an excerpt of the Battle of the Bullet. Read there's a partial transcript there that I was showing you. Malcolm was talking about this is I can't people have to study Malcolm. You can't just study Malcolm in the Nation of Islam. You can't just look at excerpts of speeches. You have to really read Malcolm's speeches. You got to you you got to read this book here by James H. Cone, Martin Malcolm in America, A Dream or a Nightmare. And James H. Cone shows how, and James H. Cone is known as the father of black liberation theology. He shows how toward the, the end of Dr. King's life and Malcolm X's life, that ideologies are converging. You study Malcolm, you study Dr. King, uh, 67, was 66, 67 and 68. Okay. And Dr. King was always a revolutionary. Dr. King used to own guns until they got arrested and convinced them. To get rid of his guns, Dr. King tried to get a concealed pistol license in 1956 in Montgomery, Alabama. All right, people don't read. Okay, this is why you got to read uh, uh, this nonviolent stuff to get you killed. How guns made the civil rights movement possible by uh, uh, Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. Hold on, I, I just had that book. You you, you got to read Dr. King's books. Dr. King wrote five books. I'm listening to what people are saying about Dr. King. I can tell they never read any of his books, probably ne never read any of his papers, uh, any of the King's papers, anything like that. Where do we go from here? Chaos of Community. He wrote this in 1967. Came, uh, this is his last book. OK, where do we go from here? Chaos of Community. Then this one here from. Uh, Where's that Malcolm X speech? Hold on. I have books arranged for the class on Saturday. This is um, this nonviolent stuff that gets you killed, how guns made the civil rights movement possible. Uh, this is by Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr., which deals with how civil rights leaders own guns and how it was Negroes with guns protecting civil rights workers and protecting uh, uh, civil rights workers protesting and things like this. OK, if it had not been for Negroes with guns, there would not have been a civil rights movement. They talk about Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth owning guns. They talk. Uh, they talk. They deal with uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, 
uh, Rosa Parks' uh, husband, uh, Raymond Parks, owned guns. All different types of things like this is a whole history dealing with how guns made the civil rights movement possible. It was ostensibly nonviolent on the surface, but it, it was Negroes with guns that made the civil rights movement possible. It was Negroes with guns that made the civil rights movement possible. Then this, this one right here, Malcolm X Speaks, um, edited with prefatory notes by George Brightman. This one right here, this has a lot of speeches from Malcolm uh, majority of them are after he leads the nation to Islam. Now, the version of the Ballad of the Bullet they have here is from April 3rd, 1964 at Corey Methodist uh, uh, Church in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. But this is, that's good. That's good as well. He uses the term uh, African-American in, in, in April 3rd, 64 as well. Now, this is before he goes to Mecca also. So you have to study the trajectory of Malcolm's life. Okay, it's the same thing with Dr. King. People try to hold Malcolm in suspended animation like uh, uh, Captain America. Same thing they do with Dr. King. They try to hold uh, Dr. King in suspended animation uh, August 28th, 1963, the March on Washington. And don't even understand the speech that was originally called Normalcy Never Again. Then the speech was called A Cancel Check. And it's later, years later, going to be called I Have a Dream. That's not what the name of the speech was when he delivered it. And the speech is about dismantling white supremacy and holding dismantling white supremacy and racism and holding America accountable for a promissory note that they gave us 100 years prior in 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation. Then when we take that promissory note to the uh, to the bank, the deposit is marked insufficient funds. So we've got to do this research. I'll talk about some of this uh, in Atlanta at the um, Juneteenth Festival. Uh, I'm speaking there on Saturday uh june 19th and sunday june 20th juneteenth festival visit juneteenth uh juneteenth atl.com juneteenth atl.com all right look we are, we have to get out of here you can support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show paypal.me forward slash the ahn show when you do it through cash app be sure to type in dollar sign the A H N show S H O W, okay, and um, be sure to type in dollar sign the the A H N show S H O W. Be sure to type in all the characters, and it'll say Michael, and it'll show my picture there, okay? Because like I said before, somebody set up a fake uh, African History Network Cash App account that's uh, similar to the mine. I've already reported them. I'm waiting on Cash App to follow up and shut them down uh and then also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ehn show paypal.me forward slash the ehn show and be sure to register for the online course that i teach on saturdays 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school we have, to have that at our website africanhistorynetwork.com okay so we appreciate the support